Morning, y'all. It's awesome to see you uh, this morning. My name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm part of our preaching team, and I want to extend my welcome to you as well if this is your first time. Uh, if you're a regular person here, we're, man, we're glad you're here as well. It's great, uh, great to see you. Uh, my wife and I have a friend named Teresa, and she's so tall that actually for her whole life, she's been known as Tree. That's her nickname is Tree, and uh, Tree went to the U of A. She was an athlete there, and uh, as, a, as a high schooler and getting into college, she wasn't a follower of Jesus, and uh, so she was, you know, kind of, uh, you know, whenever she would date, one of the things that really mattered a lot to her uh, was the height of the guy that she would date, right? She's uh, really tall, and so she always wanted to date a guy taller than her. That really limits your, your field. Um, but as she got into college, she became a follower of Jesus, and there was this guy named John that she'd been friends with for a long time, and, uh, and he, they kind of started to develop some feelings for each other. He was a Christian. She was now a Christian, and it was like, man, maybe, maybe this could happen. There was one big problem. John was shorter than tree. And so uh, she did what lots of uh, well-meaning but foolish college Christians do. Uh, She decided to play Bible roulette. Uh, Bible roulette is where you treat your Bible like a magic eight ball, and you just kind of go, all right, Lord, I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your help. I need your guidance. Please tell me something. And you read the first verse that you see. Now, this is a bad decision-making strategy, okay, because uh, these, these... These verses really weren't written about your problem exactly, Um, but she played Bible roulette and she happened to open up her Bible to 1 Samuel 16, 7. And these were the first words that she read, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. (laughs) Man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks on the heart. And 20 or so years later, they've been married this whole time. Uh, Here's a picture of John and Tree. John's the lead pastor at Redemption Peoria, and he shared this at our preaching meeting the other day, and I was like, I'm for sure telling that story. That's absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a pretty fun one. And so if you've ever been the runt, if you've ever been the last one picked, if you've ever been on the margins and on the edges, if you've ever been the person that didn't really measure up, that didn't really fit in, maybe you even feel like that right now. If you, like me, have been told that you look something like a cross between Mark Wahlberg and a Teddy Graham, (laughs) if you're not 100% confident in your appearance all the time, right, okay, this is the story for you, okay, this is the story for you. We're in this series called We Want a King. We have looked for the last five weeks at at King Saul. He was the first king of Israel, and we're turning our attention now uh, into the story of David in this series, We Want a King. That title comes from 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is where we began in this series. Uh, the people had been ruled by God. They had been led by God. They had been led out of Egypt. They had been led into this new promised land. They had been given a law. They had been given a land. They had been given a kind of constitution with the, the Ten Commandments. They had everything they needed, but they wanted more. What they asked for was a king like all the other nations. 1 Samuel 8, 19, despite Samuel's warnings, it says the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. He was a prophet. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. We want a king. This is the futile cry of the human heart. We need a king. We need a president. We need a governor. We need a coach. We need a CEO. We need a pastor. We need a leader. And we're going to put all our hope in them. And we're going to be disappointed every single time. And so they ask for a cry. They ask for the, they cry out for the king like all the other nations. That's what they get. They get Saul. The name Saul in Hebrew literally means asked for. And Saul starts out really well in chapters 9 through 11. It seems like he's really the guy. He's going to lead them into battle. He's going to be everything they hoped. But then he has three spectacular failures in chapters 13, 14, and 15 of 1 Samuel. And one commentator said Saul is the king that Israel asked for, but he's not the king they needed. And so what we saw last week in 1 Samuel 15, verse 28, uh, Samuel said to Saul, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Ouch. Now introducing David. 
If you're new to church and you go, I think I've heard of David, you have heard of David, uh, David and Goliath. That's next week. Come back, you'll go, oh, I know that story. Yeah, you do. But today is the passage where we get to know David for the first time. We're introduced to him. And so what I want to do in this is we're actually covering today all of chapter 16. I want to uh, summarize it, just make sure we understand what's going on in this passage. And then I really want to camp in on what seems to be the main point of this chapter and maybe even the main point of this whole book of 1 Samuel. So that's what we're going to do. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you um, needy, needing wisdom, needing insight, needing guidance, needing direction, needing hope, needing encouragement. So we pray that you would give that to us. God, I pray that just like the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David, the, the Spirit of the Lord would rush upon me as I speak, would rush upon us as we listen. God, that our hearts would yield to you, that we would surrender to you, that we would be attentive to you, that we would pay attention to the wisdom and the truth that you have for us today. Would it shape us and change us and direct us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in 1 Samuel chapter 16, two big things are happening just in terms of the narrator telling this whole story of 1 Samuel 16. The first thing that's happening is we're being introduced to David and to the call of David on, uh, the call of God on David's life. David in this chapter, what we just read, is anointed to be king. Now, it will be many years before he actually becomes king, but he has this, this awareness, this knowledge, this insight that God has chosen him to become king. And, and many, like, uh, many of you right, have had an experience, or maybe you're in a place now where you go, I know what I'm going to be someday, and I know, what I'm, I know what my future holds, and I'm just kind of waiting until I get there. That's sort of where David was. And so we're introduced to that call. We're also introduced to a really significant tension in the back half of the chapter as David, the future king, comes into really close proximity with the current king who doesn't know that David's been anointed king. You think that would be tense? Think that would be awkward? Yeah. And so we're introduced to that. So I'm not going to reread the whole story that uh, Dave just read for us a bit ago. You, you, you got it. I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize it by saying, you know, Samuel's the prophet's really disappointed. Saul's not going to be our guy. God says, hey, come on, let's go get off your duff. I, I got more plans for you. Go to Jesse, go to his sons. One of his sons is who I've chosen. That's who I see is going to be the king of Israel. And so uh, Eliab comes, and Eliab apparently was like the prom king and the high school you know, starting quarterback, and his future was so bright he had to wear shades. And, and so he just looked great, and, and they go, oh, surely this is the guy. And the Lord says, no, 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 not that guy. Don't look on his appearance. Don't look at his height. Man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart, and they go, okay, not him. Then brother number two comes, not him. Brother number three, not him. Brother number four, not him. All the way down to brother number 10, not him. And Samuel's going, well, we're out of brothers. Uh, Jesse, uh, by any chance, do you happen to have another one? He goes, yeah, actually, we do. He's out in the fields taking care of the sheep. Okay, we'll bring him in. And sure enough, that's David. David is anointed to be king. It says in verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now that's good news when the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon you. And a lot of us would like the Spirit of the Lord to rush upon us, to fill us, to give us strength. But, but the reason we want it is, is we think that, well, if the Spirit of the Lord was with us, then my life would be easy, and my life would be comfortable, and my life would be simple. But actually what happens is oftentimes when the Spirit of the Lord comes, he sends you into tension. So what happens here with David, he immediately is going to be called into service of the guy he's going to replace. That's tension. Same thing happens with Jesus. If you read the Gospels, the Spirit descends on him in his baptism. And then the very next verses say, and the Spirit led him into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. You want the Spirit? Great. Do you want the tension? that the Spirit is strengthening you to enter into. Eh, not so much. But David gets the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him from that day forward. This is a, a picture of the anointing of God. The Spirit of God in the Old Testament would come upon people to anoint them for particular strength, for particular missions, for particular jobs. Uh, the Spirit was not necessarily like we experience the Spirit as New Testament Christians, where the Spirit comes and indwells our life and invades our hearts and changes us and never leaves. The Spirit of God more often uh, would just come upon people for particular acts of power. But verse 14 is an interesting verse in the Old Testament because it's the only place where it tells us actually that the Spirit left. 
So the spirit rushes upon David, verse 14. Here's our tension. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. If you've been with us these last weeks, what we've seen is that Saul is not truly have a heart toward God. He's not truly repentant. He's not turning from his sins. He's got excuses. He's going to blame them. He's going to blame them. He's going to blame them. He's going to say, well, what about? And it's as though he's saying, Lord, I'd like to keep you at arm's length while I'm in charge of my life. And so in this verse, the Lord says, got it. Peace. Some of you are there. You go, how come the Lord doesn't help me? Because you said you didn't want him in your life. It's that simple. Now, the Lord is gracious, and the Lord will often with you, just like he does with Saul, crank up the temperature in our lives to make it difficult, to make it hard, to try to make us go, hey, maybe I really do need the Lord. And that's what it seems like happens as this harmful spirit from the Lord comes upon Saul. It says in verse 15, Saul's servant said to him, behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. We read that and we go, oh man, how could God do that? Well, God's allowing or causing everything. He's God. You go, well, why would God do that? Because God uses pain to get our attention. C.S. Lewis famously said that God, that, that, that God whispers in our pleasures and he shouts in our pain. And so sure enough, he allows a little pain in Saul's life to maybe try to get his attention. Will it work? Here's their suggestion, verse 16. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who's skillful in playing the lyre. Uh, the lyre is a musical instrument. We got a picture of an ancient lyre. It'd be like a little ukulele, kind of a little harp or a little guitar. This is the instrument. They say, let's get someone who's really good at playing that. And when the harmful spirit from God's upon you, he'll play it and you will be well. There's a name for this, by the way. Music therapy. How many of you go, man, music really helps me when I'm down. Music really helps me when I'm stressed. Music really helps. Of course. That's how God made it. It's one of the beautiful things about God's world is that music cures us in this way, in a sense, or at least provides some relief. And so Saul said, verse 17, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And someone says, well, sure enough, behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who's skillful in playing. He's a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence. The Lord is with him. This guy's not only good with the heart, but he's apparently really tough and really strong. And and it seems like God's presence is all over his life. Verse 19, then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who's with the sheep. And so he sent him and said in verse 21, and David came to Saul and entered his service and Saul loved him greatly. So this is going to be important as we go through the story. Because there's going to be a lot of tension between Saul and David, and you're tempted to think, oh, that's just personality. No, they loved each other. But this contrast, this tension between David as the future king, Saul as the current king, and all the jealousy that would go into it is going to tear this good relationship apart. Saul sent to Jesse, verse 22, let David remain in my service. He's found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul... David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. The Spirit of God is not here with Saul, except through David. Saul has therapy, but he didn't have God. Now, I want to just say something and make sure you understand me really clearly. Praise God for therapy. Praise God that in his common grace, he has equipped people to be able to understand the insights into our attachment and into our emotions and into our relationships and into our psychology. And praise God for physical and mental and emotional and psychological therapy. Praise God for those things. But listen, if that's all you have and you don't have God, then your healing's going to come and go. Your refreshment's going to come and go. And one of the things I hope that we take from a passage like this, just as a small little point, is that, man, I, I praise God for therapy, but, but our conviction as, a, as the people of God is we want therapy and God. We want therapy and the God of therapy. Samuel, or I'm sorry, Saul seems to not have that. The Spirit of the Lord departed from him.
So that's the story. That's the tension. And we're going to live in that tension for the next weeks as we unpack this story. But if we zoom in and go, okay, well, but all, all, that, that, all that story, what's the, what's the main point? And the main point seems to be coming from verse 7. Look again if you have your Bible at verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. There's a key word actually in this passage. In Hebrew, it's the same word, ra'ah, that keeps showing up in this passage. It shows up in verse one. Uh, God says, for I have provided ra'ah for myself, a king among his sons. This word means to see, to look, to visualize. God's saying, I, I've, I look, I can see, I've provided the, the new king. This word's used again in verse six. When they came, he looked on Eliab. In verse seven, the Lord sees, not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Saul, man, you're in trouble. Uh, we need a music therapist. Okay, verse seven, 17, provide for me. Look for a guy. Look for someone. Hey, get the resumes. Look for someone who can come. Verse 18, one of the young men says, behold, I have seen a Bethlehemite. This whole chapter is about seeing. It's about looking. It's about noticing. It's about paying attention. It's about beholding. The Lord looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. So this raises two important questions. If, if this whole chapter, and this verse in particular, is about looking, we need to ask some questions. We need to first ask, what is God looking for? All right, this is the verse. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. What is God looking for? Now listen, you might think the Lord is most interested in your circumstances. You might think the Lord is most interested in your well-being. You might think the Lord is most interested in your behavior. You might think the Lord is most interested in your money or your career or your future. Listen, the Lord is interested in all that. But what this passage tells us is the Lord is most interested in the heart. In what's going on internally. Not your external world, not your circumstances, not your money, not your fashion, not your status, not your looks, not your rep, and your heart. That's what the Lord's most interested in. Which raises a really interesting question. I don't know if you noticed this as we were reading through it, but did you notice that God says, hey, hey, man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks on the heart. Introducing David. What's the first thing we're told about David? See verse 12? And he sent and brought him in. Here's the first thing we learn. Now, he was ruddy. <laughs> the Bible uses some weird words sometimes. That word just means, like, healthy. Have you ever been like, man, you look really ruddy? I think most of us would be like, what did you say? Right? Like, that sounds offensive, but it's actually a really positive word. He looked, he looked healthy. And he had beautiful eyes. He was a real looker. And he was handsome. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait a minute. I thought the Lord didn't care about the outward appearance. He doesn't. Now, it doesn't say the Lord prefers what's ugly. It doesn't say that. It, what it's saying is, is man looks at the outward appearance and no deeper. You can still look at the outward appearance. Okay, this is what he looked like. Oh, he happened to actually be attractive. Nothing wrong with that. Some of you are gorgeous. Praise God. You don't need to repent of your beauty. But, but, but do we look deeper? Do we look a layer underneath? The Lord does. And make no mistake, the Lord is looking at our hearts. I want to take you through a number of places in the Bible that says this. In 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9, David is speaking to his son Solomon. He says this, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. The Lord searches all hearts. 
In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, a prophet will tell the king of those days, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. In Psalm 7, verse 9, David will write, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. In Jeremiah, the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart. The verse right before that says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? But I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Jesus picked up on this in Luke 16. He was constantly interacting with these religious leaders who only cared about the external stuff. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Paul picks up on it, his letter to the Thessalonians, just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Everyone sees the surface. The Lord sees below the surface. I don't know how many of you are rejoicing like I'm rejoicing that from now until the beginning of February, every week, there's going to be football on TV. I mean, <laughs> praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. Every week, there's going to be football on television, whether it's preseason or college or NFL or postseason. I mean, oh, bowls, oh, it's amazing. Uh, one of the coolest things, if you're, uh, if you're not into football, uh, football fans understand this, one of the coolest things in the last number of years with pro football um, has been uh, the, the, one of the new announcers that's doing a lot of the big time games is Tony Romo. Tony Romo was a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, had a really good career. And uh, when he retired from football, the very next season, he was in the booth and he was in like the A1 booth, the like, biggest game of the week. Those are the ones he would do. And, uh, you know, because he's a big personality or whatever, sometimes people don't like him. But, but what's really gotten a lot of folks' attention is when you watch a, a game that Tony Romo's announcing, right, you see the formation and you see the plays, but, but Tony Romo is known for, he will so often tell you exactly what's going to happen. Right? You look at the formation and you might go, oh, that star player's in. Or maybe you know like a, a tiny bit, like, oh, they're in trips, which means three wide receivers. That's like the extent of my formation knowledge. But Tony Romo will go, oh, 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 this guy's going to blitz. And then they're going to run a, a, off the right tackle and the guard's going to pull. And, it's, ah, ah, and, he and then <laughs> sure enough, that's what happens. Why? Because Tony Romo has insight. Tony Romo has a depth of understanding. Tony, Tony Romo has this ability, given all this experience, to go, okay, this is actually what's going on. The Lord made us. The Lord knows us. When we can look at the outward stuff. The Lord can look below. The Lord knows what's motivating. The Lord knows what's happening. The Lord knows really what's going on in us. He looks below the surface. So make no mistake, the Lord's looking in our hearts. The question then is, what is he looking for and what is he noticing? Well, when he looks, he notices some negative stuff and some positive stuff. Let's look first at the negative stuff. This is from Jesus. The leaders around Jesus, I think I mentioned this already, they were obsessed with externals. You had to be around the right certain people. You had to follow the certain external rules. You know, there was all this stuff about what you could eat and washing your hands before. And there was all this concern that all these external things were what defiled you, what, what made you sinful. And Jesus comes along and says, no, no, no. What actually defiles you is what comes from within. Here's what he said in Mark 7. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. You thought your circumstances made you do it. Your family of origin made you do it. Your education and your opportunity and your this and this and this. You think that's you know, and now, like, hey, I just, don't blame me. Jesus, this is Jesus saying, no, 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 all that stuff that's broken in you, it came out of your heart. And your heart is like, you know, when you're in 10th grade and you're doing chemistry and 
and, and you know, there's that crucible and it's got some unknown stuff in it and you turn the Bunsen burner on and you see what comes out. The Bunsen burner is the circumstances of life and it cranks up the heat, but whatever's in there is going to come out. Whatever's in your heart is going to come out. And so Jesus says, when I look in hearts, I see a lot of pride. I see a lot of deceit. Jesus said elsewhere, when you hate somebody, it's murder in your heart. So he's going, I see that. I see lots of sexual morality. Rather than seeing sex as this beautiful thing given by God for people in marriage, it's now become this weaponized, individualistic, power, abusive thing. All that's coming out of our hearts. Sort of looks at our hearts and <laughs> it's scary, right? Like some people go, hey, hey, man, just you got to, you know, I know what's in my heart. And Jesus goes, so do I. <laughs> Are you sure you know what's in your heart? So that's the negative side. Now there's a positive side. And we get a picture of this in Isaiah chapter 66. It's really interesting the way that the Lord sets this up. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. You get the picture? God's sitting on the throne. Heaven's his throne. The earth is his footstool. That's what he's putting his legs up on. You know, he's got the lazy boy on the earth. That's how massive God is, is this picture. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. This is the Lord's way of saying, hey, I don't need you. I'm God. I'm good. Right? And, and you would go, man, that seems like God's pretty disinterested in us. And it's God's way of saying, hey, I'm big, I'm powerful, I'm sovereign. But he's not disinterested because look at what it says next. But this is the one to whom I'll look. This is who grabs my attention. This is who I'm attracted to. This is who I'm drawn to. This is what makes, makes me go, oh, yeah. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's what the Lord's looking for in our hearts. He sees lots of these negative things. He's looking for this humility, this brokenness, this listening to his word and, and trembling, wanting to do what God says. And, and what these verses should do is, is tell us, hey, this is why we need Jesus. Because when God looks at our hearts, it ain't pretty. There's a lot of pride. There's a lot of deceit. There's a lot of puffed upness. There's a lot of comparison. And we need Jesus. We need the one who truly had a pure heart, who pours himself out for us to give us a new heart. See, the whole Old Testament story is a bunch of people trying to think that if they could just follow God's rules, their lives would change. And over and over, what they see is, no, that's not going to happen. And so the prophets come on the scene and they say, hey, what you need is a new heart. And that's what Jesus came to give us. It's a new heart. So that's what God's looking for. The, the next crucial question is this. What are we looking for? If man looks at the outward appearance and the Lord looks at the heart, then what are we looking for? Now, I realize, verse 7, man looks at the outward appearance. That's like just generally speaking, human beings, humanity, that's what they do. So, it's not surprising when, when people who aren't Christians, when people who aren't claiming to be followers of Jesus, when they just care about the externals, the Bible's saying that's normal. The question is for us who are followers of Jesus. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm thrilled you're here. You can just kind of listen in while I poke at us Christians. What are we looking for? And are we looking for all the same things everyone else is? Or are we looking for the heart? Some of you are single. And you're looking for someone. What are you looking for? Are you looking for someone who's tall enough? Someone who's like eight to ten hot, two to th three crazy. <laughs> someone with a certain kind of body. I've always been more of a blonde guy. Okay? You're looking for a guy with enough money, good enough job, good enough pedigree, good enough education. What are you looking for? You're a follower of Jesus. The Lord's looking at your heart, and he's made your heart new. He's given a new priority. 
which is a heart that's humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at his word. What if you looked for a man like that? You go, well, there aren't any. I know. That's why we got a lot of work to do. But are we looking for that? Parents, what about in our kids? What are we looking for? What really makes us go, oh, man, I'm so proud of them? Isn't it often their grades? And how many points they score? One of the things that make us go, oh, man, I don't know. We got to talk to them. Ah. Uh, it's, it's what we really want out of our kids, if we're honest, is we want them to do non-embarrassing stuff, <laughs> especially when they're little. Right, then, then we get all, you know, they become adolescents and teenagers, and they got to express themselves, and they're going to be totally unique, just like everybody else. <laughs> and, and what do we do? We focus on all the externals, don't we? Hey, uh, how much would it cost to get a whole pair of jeans instead of one with all the holes in it? Right, and we ridicule them over their fashion and over their... And that's the nature of our relationship, is us badgering them over how they look. What if we cared about their heart? Okay, so they're pierced so much, it looks like they fell in a tackle box. Okay, fine. <laughs> What's their heart? What about in our friends? If we're honest, we kind of look for some people that seem like up-and-comers, seem like they'd be a fun time. They go on cool vacations. I like what I see on Instagram. Friends. What are we looking for in our leaders? What are you looking for in the people who are influencers? Right? I know we all go, ah, influencers. <laughs> you know, that's stupid. But we all have influencers, don't we? There's people you follow on social media. There's podcasts you listen to. There's YouTube channels you're subscribed to. People that you have said, I want them to influence me. Who are they? And, and what's their heart like, as best as you can tell? Does it seem aligned with yours? Or are we going, you know what? I, I really like them because they have the same enemies as me. How, and, and so you've decided to allow them to disciple you. And yet your heart commitments are just worlds apart. Is that wise? Okay, those are one kind of leaders. What, what about church leaders? What are you looking for in a pastor? Well, I want him to be a good communicator, a little bit funny, but not too funny. If, if, if once a month he could say something I've never heard before, that would be kind of cool. I'd feel like it was really deep. And uh, how many of you ever picked a church because of the pastor's prayer life? How many of you ever asked? And I know now I'm going to get a bunch of questions about this. So I'm going to start. I got to really, babe. I got to start praying this week more. You know? But we, we're so disappointed in the failure of church leaders. How could they fail? Well, we never cared about their character. We just liked how clever they were or how brash they were or how smart they were. And then they fell apart and we said, man, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with us? We don't mind if these church leaders are falling apart internally as long as externally they're holding it together. Okay, should we even talk about political leaders? What are we looking for? I want to fire. I want someone to fight just like Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. I realize it's like you don't get a lot of options to vote with candidates with hearts like Jesus. So you got to do your best. But how, how like emotionally do you get into like, yeah, 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 yeah. The Lord tends to give us what we look for. What are we looking for? What are we, what are we, what are we looking for in our status, in our sense of well-being? So many of us, we're like high school kids. We're just looking for all the same stuff we've always looked for. And What about in ourselves? 
So, some of us, we're so mean to ourselves. Some of you are so mean to yourself. Right? Because you, the hairline's this, and it's getting a little bad, and your skin's not as what it was, and your weight, uh, and your feet. Well, no one likes their feet. Uh, one of my little <laughs> guilty pleasures is these uh, chiropractic videos on YouTube. I'm kind of, I can go down the <laughs> rabbit hole on those because I love, it's so satisfying to hear the cracks. Uh, I, don't, I don't like, I, I've been to a chiropractor like maybe twice in my life. I'm not like a chiropractor person, but I love these ASMR like cracky videos. They're so, oh, they're so satisfying. Um, <laughs> But I was watching this one the other day, and this, this gal had kind of a hump on her neck because her posture's been off and your body adjusts, and so she had this hump like back behind her here, and she was probably, I don't know, she was maybe 40 years old or something, and so the chiropractor was adjusting her and working with her on her posture and stuff like that, and she said something so insightful. She said, I think about this hump all day, every day. Let me ask you, what's your hump? Your hair's a little thin. There's falling out where it should be growing. It's growing where it shouldn't be growing. Like what? What's your hump? We all have a hump. Can I tell you something? The Lord doesn't care a lot about that. You're obsessing over your hump, and you're obsessing over your weight, and you're obsessing over your height, and you're obsessing over this and over this and over this. And the Lord's going, "I'm not obsessed over that. I'm obsessed with your heart." With your character, with your humility, with your love, with your affection, with your godliness. That's what I'm obsessed with. And we keep looking to these saviors that can't save, these external things that are worthless. And so, as Dale Ralph Davis says, sometimes the Lord must save us from our saviors. The Lord has to come and say, I, I, I'm going to save you from all this. And that's what he does. And so, isn't it interesting that when the son of David, the Messiah King, the one who actually is the king of all kings, when he's predicted in Isaiah chapter 53, do you know how the description we get of him? He had, it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was spectacularly unspectacular. He was not impressive for his looks. He was impressive for his heart. And it was he who was pierced for our transgressions. He who was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. We need new hearts. And friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a new heart. And so let, let's let this passage just say, oh yeah, I have a new heart. I have a new perspective. Let me lean into that one. What we're going to do for the rest of our service together is just celebrate the way that God saves us from our saviors. That's what we're going to hear. We're going to hear a number of stories as we celebrate these baptisms of here's these things I used to look to. Here's these things that used to be king. And here's how God saved me from those false saviors. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word and the challenge that it is to us. And we pray now that you would speak and that you would minister to us. God, we pray that you would bless us through these stories and bless us through these times of praise and worship and singing. And God, we pray that we would begin to focus on what you're focused on. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.